Okay, I think we're we are live, so to speak. So welcome everybody to this discussion panel, uh, many perspectives on many analyst studies. My name is Nate Bresnow. I am a postdoctoral researcher in social science at the University of Bremen. I'm joined by Balaj, Rotem, Wilson, and Eric. I'll let each of them kind of introduce themselves the first time they speak so they can say all the nice things about themselves. And um, yeah, I, I just wanna give a quick um, introduction for any of you who are sitting in the audience who are not aware of what this many analyst studies uh, thing is. And it's basically put, it's a type of study where there's one or a couple of specific hypotheses being tested, usually with the same data set. And it's given to many researchers, what has often referred to as many analysts to see if they can um, so to test different hypotheses. And there's a lot of variations on these studies that we're gonna talk about in terms of uh, ranking other participants' models or uh, prediction markets and, and several other things. And so um, as of right now, and we'll share a link to this, um, Balaj has actually uh, developed a list of all, all the known many analyst studies, and you could also add to it if you like. There are not so many. There are maybe 10 or 12 out there. We're not 100% sure if we, we've got them all, um, but it's, it's in the past, especially five years, this has become a thing, if you will. And in many ways, if I'm not mistaken, it was really kicked off by this famous soccer study or football in, in probably a majority of the world, um, which tested if, uh, if referees were biased in their giving of cards to darker skinned players. And um, Eric was actually uh, part of that study. And so I think a nice way to kick this off is to have Eric um, tell us a bit about how that study came about and, and, and what that was like. So if you'd like to kick us off, Eric. Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, th thanks everyone for being here. You know, welcome. We welcome from where you know wherever you are. Uh, 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 I'm Eric Goldman. I'm an associate prof uh, of organizational organizational behavior uh, here at INSEAD, and I was indeed one of the many many authors, many collaborators on uh, on the referee red cards paper uh, that Nate refers to. Although I should mention, you know, th there are kind of precursors, you know, kind of in the in the in the kind of crowdsourcing literature and our application to kind of. Many analysis was uh, was a little bit of a twist on on on, on past work. Um, I also really want to credit uh, uh, Raphael Silberzon, uh, then PhD student, uh, who really uh, who really drove the project forward, uh, and Dan Martin and Brian Nosek, also other members of the of the uh, of the core team, and then also of course our many many collaborators, without whom uh, none of it none of it would have been uh, would have been possible. Uh, but the story of the referee red cards paper uh, actually starts with a with an earlier small teams paper. Uh, this is an article that uh, Raphael and I did uh, um, when he was a student and I was a, and I was a system professor where, well, at least we thought we had found uh, in a large sample uh, of, uh, uh, from Germany that individuals who had a noble sounding name. So in German, their name kind of implies, you know, it's, it's, it means like Duke or, or King or implies aristocracy, that such individuals were more likely to hold managerial positions. So, you know, and we, we, we thought this was some evidence at least of some sort of maybe status halo effect, for example. Um, you know, so, so, so we published a paper. Uh, it's a small teams paper, uh, and then our 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 data was requested by uh, Yuri Simonson, of course, you know, very well known, uh, uh, very well known meta scientist and scientist. And, and Yuri did a reanalysis of our data. He, he essentially did a, had a better way of collecting the data, collected much more data, and then also had a, a better specification, uh, a different analysis, but there was also a better analysis. Uh, we ultimately agree. Uh, and then he found like, like nothing, like not a zilch, like in fact, if anything, the effect is slightly in the other, in, in the other direction. You know, so it, we actually ended up writing a collaborative commentary uh, uh, with, uh, with Simonson, where we actually kind of replied to our own, to our own paper. Uh, you know, so, so that's quite an unusual experience, I think. Uh, um, uh, but it also, uh, it also led to some quite good things. Uh, so that led us to kind of wonder, you know, what would happen if we took another data set we were planning on using for a paper and, you know, we gave it to somebody else to analyze or maybe many someone else's to analyze, right? And so we ended up uh, uh, distributing this referee red card data set, which we had been planning to use for a project, uh, to 29 teams of analysts around the world who at least initially independently analyzed it without knowing what each other was doing. Later, they were allowed to talk, but at the beginning, they weren't. 
uh, and then you know turned in their specifications and results, right? And, you know, and the finding was that uh, different different analysts, you know, in good faith, without much of an incentive to find anything one way or the other, chose different specifications and got really quite uh, really quite uh, quite different results, right? You know, so this this then you know became a bit of a line of research for us, and then it's exciting to see other folks interested enough in this, you know, to go through the effort. Uh, uh, you know, to uh, both folks here in the panel and then here in spirit, right, you know, collaborators around the world, uh, you know, kind of picking this up and looking at, you know, is this, is this itself a robust phenomenon, right, the tendency for many analysts to find, uh, to find many different things. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So uh, it is amazing what, what you and your colleagues have started um, Open Pandora's Box, you might say, and um, I would be interested to hear from Balaj actually at, at this point, who is um, doing some current work, but has also published work on sort of the the idea of many analyst studies and 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 conducting them. So Balaj, would you like to come in? Yes, uh, hello everyone. I'm Balaj Ratsir from Budapest, Hungary, and uh, we do meta research, meta science research. In fact, we just changed the na name of the lab. To, to meta science lab last week because uh, it was called decision lab until now but I really realized we just uh, moved on to meta science so much that uh, we have to rename ourselves yeah so uh, our story is that with each uh, of we were uh, you know others we were developing a guidance on transparent uh, reporting and uh, at one point we, we got to uh, multiverse and uh, multi-analysis uh, approach. And uh, while uh, I had some thoughts on how I would give advice on how to run a, a many analyst uh, project, but uh, for multi-analysts, I, I couldn't see how one can explain how to uh, set up the reasonable or sensible options for, for each step. So I, I assume the listeners are familiar with Multiverse in that it's enough if one researcher um, uh, takes not just one path in the analysis, but uh, at each uh, step of the analysis takes all the reasonable options. Uh, so I this can uh, lead to a, a huge number of results. If you think there are five steps in the analysis and each time you choose five parameters, there's over 3,000, if you take p-value, 3,000 p-values at the end. And it's, but partly it's hard, I think, to evaluate the results in, in, in this way. And also, uh, how can you argue that these are all, these will be all reasonable? So how, my, our thinking here was that what, what is a reasonable result here? And, and I think one definition can be that there would be a researcher taking that path, actually. There would be a researcher saying, this is, for me, the most sensible one. So uh, many analysts approach take, takes uh, more focus to this di dimension of the diversity that um, each analyst independently takes the path that uh, he or she thinks that's the most reasonable. And then when we have the collection of results, these all represent someone's uh, best, uh, best guess of how to find an answer from, from that data to that research question. But then I, I got also fascinated by the history of this many analyst approach. I don't know if everyone is familiar with that. In fact, it goes back to the 19th century. 1857, the Royal Asian Society um, uh, wanted to get a, a new Asian ancient Assyric uh, language cuneiform uh, script to be translated. And, and I think this, this example explains the, the, all the benefits of this many analyst approach is that uh, there was a linguist who uh, had a guess of what it could mean. But then if you publish it, then how, how can you tell that this is the, the right translation? It can be anything for a, a non-scholar uh, uh, to that area would uh, have to say, I, I, I have no other options than it, except what the expert says. So in fact, they ask four um, experts to translate independently the same script. 
And then they opened the envelopes at the same time and, uh, and uh, compared the four translations. And when they found that all the four translations were almost identical, then they, uh, they, they I can quote, they say, uh, they have the truth for their basis. So, so it's highly unlikely that they would get to the same translation, uh, just um, making it up or, or making some mistakes. So I think that's, there's a whole idea about uh, the manualist approach. If the answers converge, then you, you can get more confidence that uh, what, what you have is not just an ad hoc interpretation of that data set. And when they diverge, then they uh, also uh, you should be cautious interpreting the conclusions because uh, it might depend a lot on the identity of the analyst. And, and that's what I think currently we don't know about social science is how much our results depend on the, uh, I would say the analyst himself or herself. Okay, this is, two especially really interesting topics that I definitely want to cover about the, the multiverse perspective, but I think we'll pick that one up a little later. But more to this um, later point, maybe I can go over to Rotem in your study. Um, did you expect a convergence? Did, did you ex expect to find what Balaj is talking about? Because um, this is not what the outcomes of most of our studies have pointed to. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'm Rotem uh, Budvini Knetzer. I'm a postdoc at Dartmouth College, uh, neuroscience, and I was part of the organizing team of NARPS, the Neuroimaging, uh, replication, uh, uh, the Neuroimaging Analysis, Replication, and Prediction Study. Um, and yeah, what we, what we did was uh, we collected a new data set of fMRI with 109 participants, and we uh, distributed it to 70 analysis teams. And we uh, got their results for nine different hypotheses. And like Nate already <laughs> said, uh, we got really di diverse uh, answers from this. And I think one of our reviewers actually said it the best. He said that it was the results were both straddling and not surprising at the same time. So I think, yes, I kind of expected it. I couldn't affect it. Like I couldn't bias the results because I, I wasn't part of the analysis. The organizing team wasn't part of the analysis. Uh, but I think just because we already know about a lot of uh, things like peaking and like, you know, different there are so many analytical choices that you can make mainly in MRI, not mainly, but many, I mean, many in com complex data with uh, a lot of dimensions and fMRI is one of them. Um, I think for anyone who's doing it, it's actually kind of obvious that there are a lot of you know, points where you can make different decisions. And I think it makes sense that it would lead to different uh, outcomes. Also, we, we saw Eric and colleagues uh, paper and we knew that in other fields, this is the case. So I think I wasn't, too surprised, but I was like seeing it, you know, just watching 70 teams, like all of our teams just made different, no two teams chose the same pipeline, the exact same pipeline. It was crazy. I didn't expect that, I have to admit. Uh, there aren't like, you know, um, common standards that everyone followed. So I, I wasn't expecting all the teams to do the same, but I was expecting some clusters of teams to do very similar things. So I was surprised by that. And I was surprised by how different the results have been, uh, I, have to, I have to say. Um, yeah, and I think we can learn a lot from these studies. Uh, like Balad said, it's not the same, like a multiverse analysis, you just, you know, a single analyst can just run many pipelines and see what happens. But it's not the same as making sure they are all reasonable and would have been chosen by researchers. And also this way we can see how the field really works, right? What's happening in the literature, because this is what people are using. And I think we really need to find solutions and ways on how to make results reliable to this analytical uh, variability. And multiverse, as Balat said, is one of the promising steps. And with more studies like uh, we did and Eric, like everyone here did and other people, um, we can learn if this is a problem in all fields or you know, what's the problem, if the problem is in the research question or in the methods or in you know, um, random, like your study nature's kind of. Um, and, and then we can try to you know, find solutions and point, if you, if you wanna do a multiverse analysis, we, we need to point people to which pipelines they need to run because it's not reasonable to just run all the million different things you could do. Some of them don't make sense. So I think we can really use these kind of studies to learn about the problem and point us to the solutions, which I'm hoping we could start direct ourselves to because I really, like, I don't know about all of you, but when I read a paper, I'm, I keep thinking, okay, but what if they would have done something else, you know, would it be the same? And I think it's very important to know that. Um, 
yeah so it was a great experience and, and I, I learned a lot from it and i hope the field did the neuroimaging field um and like going back to your question yeah i was surprised and not surprised at the same time i think yeah yeah and maybe i uh, send the next question over to wilson and that is well it's actually somewhat the same question and and that is i mean balaj said something which i believed going into my study, our study that we did, which was, we're going to find certain areas of agreement that will really tell us something about the hypothesis we're testing. Didn't happen at all. If we look across all the studies which are in the list in the uh, Google Drive document, this also basically didn't happen. So then it, it starts to feel like, okay, you know, it's not a huge N sample, right? There's maybe 10 or 12 studies that have done this, but they, they all are somewhat similar in the sense of kind of going in every direction. And so what, what can we really learn? Or have we, you know, are we yet to learn what we're really hoping to learn? That is substantively. Well, uh, thanks Nate first for gathering us all. You know, the first mover is always the most difficult one. And you, by individually pulling us all together, like I think we're very grateful for that. Well, I'm Wilson, I'm a researcher at NCR. And my research dives into the areas of negotiation, culture, morality, and of course, meta science. Well, to kickstart, I'll say that this field of many analysts is growing. And a good thing to note is that meta science and many analyst papers are gaining more traction, right? There was a paper by Martin Swinsberg, which includes Eric Ullman and myself. It was recently published at uh, OBHDP and has recently been on their most downloaded page. So this also shows that um, this field is gaining traction and this type of methodology and science is growing as the years go by. And it's something that uh, I will urge everyone to be involved at some point of their career. In terms of the learning points, there are so many, but one of the key things is that we spoke a lot about the multiverse, but we should only do it if it's very viable because like not everyone would wanna do like, let's say a very big project or we are all like, we all have institutional rules and things that we have to like abide by. So another way you can do it is to pre-register certain robustness checks. And of course have many sensitivity analysis that can sort of like help make our science better. We can seek opinions from expert leaders, you know, statisticians by, for their statistics, research designs, hypothesis from our fellow peers and reserving the high confidence for consistent inferences that we have. We can focus on more uh, empirical manipulations during our analysis and opposed to latent constructs that sometimes are not like, observable in our research. And they also should communicate a certain level of uncertainty in their probability distribution as well. Additionally, there was a paper that we sort of had at uh, Behavior and Brain Sciences. It's a commentary on Yaconi's generability crisis. So, well, there's a lot of high amount of research degree, uh, degrees of freedoms, and of course, a substantial amount of ways that a researcher can choose and analyze their data set. So strategies that we want to draw inferences from heterogeneous set of approaches includes aggregation and parsing, which is something that we sort of want to talk about. So in, in terms of aggregation, we are focusing on method analyzing the effect size obtained by different investigators. All of us have many analysts that analyze it, but if we look at them together, we can sort of aggregate them together and of course, pass them, right? Passing them involves using a perspectivistic approach, uh, attempting to identify more theoretical meaningful moderators and explain variability in some kind in hopes to create a better science. And that's uh, somewhat like what this Ausburg and Brudel paper has done with the original soccer study, right? Eric, I don't know if you wanna talk about that a little bit or parsing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so, so as Wilson notes, you know, on the one hand, you could say, well, let's just average across everybody's approach. Uh, we, you know, we've done that in crowd projects, both with uh, analyses, right, uh, specifications in a complex data set, and with uh, uh, experimental data. So if different people design different experiments to test the same hypothesis, one thing you could do is aggregate across them and kind of take that as, you know, maybe that's Maybe that's our most reliable estimate, but you know, as Wilson notes, you could also, you know, in the perspectivist spirit, right? You know, uh, you know, with, with, with the great, you know, the great Bill McGuire, you could say, well, maybe we can find meaningful moderators that explain why some analyses or some designs or some approaches get a certain get, get a certain estimate, and others uh, and others get different ones. As Nate notes, that's been a bit frustrating so far. So even if you try to get a lot of potential explanatory variables and try to, you know. Uh, capture variance in the dispersion and estimates across different approaches. Uh, that can be 
that the yield isn't great, right? It's usually a small minority of the variance, but I don't, that doesn't mean, I, I don't think that means that we should give up. Uh, and there's all kinds of things that we could use. So, you know, it could be data pro, uh, pre-processing steps for some kinds of complex data. Uh, it could be choice of statistical approach. Uh, it could be uh, covariates. We found some evidence in Sobozin et al. that covariates matter. Uh, 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 Martin Schweinsberg uh, and colleagues, among, the, among them Wilson, uh, uh, as Wilson mentioned, we have a paper finding that operationalizations of variables matter. So how you choose to operationalize your, your IV and your DV uh, does explain a bit of, does explain a significant amount of the variance. Uh, and another really cool one is uh, potentially, I, or, or, or I think very likely, uh, Osberg and Brutal will point out that it might also be the way in which people are kind of thinking about the research question, right? Are, are you looking at, you know, is there a direct causal effect of, um, of, player, of player skin tone on 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 referee red card decisions, uh, are you are you trying to say you know that ref the player skin tone explains uh, unique variance you, you know despite everything else you know in terms of variance explained or does it explain variance above all the other variables so there's different kinds of ways in which you could be thinking about this so you know you can even kind of have a branch of you know the garden of forking pass where there's a motivating issue you know is there is there is there racial bias in society something very general. Then there's a conceptual research question. You know, is there a relationship between player skin tone and uh, referee decisions in particular, uh, which might be red cards? Uh, and then from there, you could have more of an empirical research question, right? Something more specific, like, you know, is there a direct cause evidence of a direct causal effect of skin tone on, on red cards? And then you could have the different variable operationalizations. How do you measure? Uh, how do you measure, you know, do you use yellow cards or red cards, right? Uh, or how do you operationalize status, you know, in, in, in Schweinsberg, in Schweinsberg at all, then you have to choose covariates, you have to choose, uh, you know, uh, you have, there's so many different kinds of choices, but maybe if we kind of, kind of map out that full model of all the choice points, and put them all together, we can try to identify these meaningful moderators in the perspective spirit, and that would be more the parsing approach, I'll try to find meaningful moderators, rather than just aggregate across everything. But I think that's a really exciting future direction for this line of research, for this society. And so maybe for any of the other panelists, the, the question then that arises, at least for me, is do we need the many analysts then to give us this is what the analyst decisions might be, and then we could simulate them in the multiverse? Or do, I mean, it's obviously a lot less resource intensive to just go to the multiverse in the first place. Maybe one of the other three of you has something to comment, Balaj, maybe? Yes. Um, so. I think it uh, reaches a, an important question that uh, partly, do we really need uh, many analyst uh, projects? Uh, should all uh, empirical projects have independent uh, analysts? And so, uh, so but uh, also you mentioned that those uh, published uh, multi-analyst projects uh, don't show uh, converging results, but um, therefore I think that Right now, the big question in this area of uh, meta science is that: is it is it a general trend, or or maybe those projects picked kind of data sets in order to demonstrate that um, that analysts can diverge? So we don't know how much it represents the field, how much it is a general um, phenomenon in in social sciences. Uh, right now, with the Center for Open Science, we are organizing a big, a quite big project where we will um, have multi-analyst um, analysis for 100 published, uh, the, the, the data of 100 already published papers from, from all areas of uh, social science. That will be hundreds of analysts. So, so that's, that's quite big, but uh, basically you, you need this kind of information to, to have some intuition about the field. And um, also, what if, what if we find divergent results and what would that show? I think if we don't know that, but if we, if we get it, then I think we are in a very serious case in which means that uh, so far, I think in the scientific reform, we believe that the, we identified certain issues and uh, such as fraud and uh, uh, biases, questionable practices, and so on. And there is, I think, the hidden promise that if we get rid of them, then we can trust the results. But here comes the, the, the big issue with the, the many analyst projects uh, show that we call it analytical uh, 
sensitivity or robustness question, whether even if a researcher can take all the steps carefully and have a well-powered sample for that design and to have the, the most advanced statistical approach and so, and, and doing everything transparently and openly and pre-registered, uh, and the peer reviewer will say, yes, all the steps were legit, and so it should be published, but still the conclusion can be quite arbitrary because another analyst can take another legitimate path in the, as we call it, analytical space and can come to a different conclusion. Therefore, if it is a general phenomenon, then we, we have to question the whole uh, empirical published literature, whether even if they give the impression of legitimate results and legitimate conclusions, these conclusions might have only a loose connection to the uh, data that were gathered. But it all depends on uh, how much they are dependent or contingent on, on the analyst uh, person. And um, also, I think the other uh, issue comes up is that uh, why would, um, as you say, why not just do multiverse and uh, let the analyst true take these steps? But um, as the saying goes, that uh, most studies have the data analyzed by the worst person, the most biased person is the author who has investments in that theory or hypothesis and have certain idea what uh, he or she wants uh, to see. And um, uh, therefore, I think we're do, do, inviting uh, independent analysts to invite people who are less involved in that question and less uh, biased, even if it's not a conscious bias, sometimes just being in the field or having papers published with certain results uh, pushes you towards certain steps. So um, I can't see how you can uh, bypass this kind of bias uh, by allowing the researcher uh, take all, all the options. You, as a reader, you will still can have doubts whether uh, these were somehow led by the, the analyst interest. So I think, I think um, whether uh, we are dealing with a huge issue is still a question, but if it is, then, then uh, we will have to have some general approach to, to deal with that. Otherwise we are lying to ourselves that we believe in uh, published conclusions when they might be extremely uh, contingent on, on the concrete analytical path that the, the analyst took. Uh, so, but you asked first, I didn't answer. Yes, we, we developed a guidance which, by which we try to simplify the task. Anyone who tries to run a multiverse analysis, uh, we hope that soon it will be published with preprint available, um, that we, we give templates and, and um, very practical steps of how to do that. Sometimes just employing uh, one or two other analysts to the project can already uh, give some idea about the robustness of the, the results. So uh, we hope that it, it will become more general. And I, I think it, it could be even expected for those kind of uh, results which have strong or important um, effects on clinical practice or, or some policy making and so Okay, that's great to hear. And if you have a, a link to a preprint or yeah, anything, I, I'm I sure the audience would, would be definitely interested in that. And um, I, I want to come to the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. But before I do, I want to just uh, check that Wilson or Rotem, if you wanted to come in on that same topic first and before we go. Yeah, um, I can. I, so first of all, I agree with almost everything about that said. Um, and I think you also spoke to one of the, the, the first question in the Q&A, uh, because one thing that's really problematic about the, um, the analytical variability is that even if you pre-register and if you share your data and you share your code, it's still a problem because you still like someone needs to take it and test another, you know, another pipeline to make sure it's robust or do something else to make sure it's robust. So I think one problem here is that like the great new practices that we're trying to implement are just not enough. Uh, if this is an actual problem, I believe it is, but we, we, we need more uh, papers and products to show that. Um, and another thing uh, I want to touch on is that, so 
I'm trying to think about like the future and what's practical. And it doesn't seem like it's practical to expect every single study to have multi, you know, analysts. Um, so trying to think about what maybe should happen or could happen is that maybe within each field we could have multi-analyst projects like we like we starting to have and uh, trying to um, quantify the problem and make sure you know see if we have it or not. And if we do learn about it and try to see which steps are you know very different between people or which step um, derive the most variability and then we could based on this we could uh, like start to focus on multiverse analysis or something else that would use this information to actually build like new solutions a new way to do research in a single lab um, uh, level so for example in fMRI you know each pipeline takes a lot of time it's really uh, demanding computationally so I wouldn't expect and every lab to be able to do like thousands different pipelines. But if we can focus on, I don't know, like 10 different pipelines that could work, maybe we could build a tool that will be efficient to do it. And then people could actually do it in a single lab, uh, at a single study level. And also one thing I think we didn't touch upon on uh, multi-analyst projects, which I really felt in ARPS, in our uh, study, is that once the community, like the field is really engaged and many people are involved, uh, it helps for, for like the conclusions to actually, you know, get to the field because many people are there, many people are part of it. You know the problem. You you know you, you feel part of it, and I think it's really important too to like motivate an entire field to actually change their practices because starting to do a multiverse analysis, like as a standard practice, is not the, right. It's not so easy, but if you're motivated to do it, it will be easy. So I really think that this was part of the like one of the most amazing things in the study that like I felt in our study is that like people were really engaged, uh, put a lot of effort in it and really cared about it. And I think it really helped for it to make an impact on the field. Yeah, thanks. And I'll, I'll ask uh, Wilson uh, so, uh, to comment on that question. But first, let me say something before I forget. If any of you out there is thinking about doing a many analyst study, please talk to somebody who has already done a many analyst study or ideally everybody possible who has already done a many analyst study because uh, especially in our study, for example, um, there were so many mi mi mistakes or, or just steps in hindsight where we were like, oh my gosh, we really should have done that differently. For example, we had the, the analysts pre-register their models with us, but the pre-registration was basically, here's a blank sheet, write down what your model's gonna be. Uh, so there was no standardization and we were unable to use these because some did say which estimator they would use, others did not. And some said, so you see what I mean? So there are so many steps in the process that you might not have thought of. And because it's so resource intensive, right? It's so resource intensive to do these. You want to really have a strong research design. So that's my, my plug for you. And Wilson, take it away. Yeah, and, on, and to also add on to what Nate just said, like, I think Balash has this like great system. I mean, everyone is a co-contributor to how it's how to design it, the problems we face from the other projects. So it will be a sort of a good stepping stone if you want to start your own analyst, many analyst project or to even just get involved with some of us. Uh, I think one of the things that Rotten also spoke about in future directions is the idea of incentivization. So I feel that sometimes like not all of us want to make a crowd project. You know, sometimes we want to have small author strings. I mean, it might not be the right time for us. So, you know, of course, crowd science is an option to create like many authors to get other people involved. However, not all the time that this might be the most viable choice. So, I mean, you can also think of doing something like a hackathon, right? So instead of having them have co-authors co to incentivize them, you can also create incentives like on Kaggle where you have a rich um, group of people with deep expertise, you know, conducting a hackathon, con conducting, uh, controlling various variables like team distribution, time spent, and expertise. And these are ways you can sort of make everything more robust for yourselves. And it also puts additional checks on your science and on your research as well. And, okay, I think we can, um, in a way, maybe we have uh, responded to chat's uh, Q&A question. And thanks, by the way, for putting this really interesting link in the chat box. Um, and uh, Ramey, if I, if I said the name correctly, also posted something which, if I understand the question, is about uh, individuals' own perceptual interpretations or experiences of, of things or reality. And at least for me in our study, this was a, this was a really challenging point. Um, we had given them the hypothesis that immigration reduces support for social policy. Um, and what happened was many 
and we gave them the data and there, there were like six questions from this international social survey program. And what happened was um, some people really, uh, their, their perception was that there were actually two different attitudes at play. And for these teams, they, they of course created two attitudes, sort of latent constructs and put them out of the data. And the criticism we just got in our, in our most recent rejection was that because the researchers themselves had perceived different, different attitudes at play, they were actually testing different hypotheses. So even though they had this kind of same very general hypothesis and the same start data, that because of their perceptions or their own concept that they were actually testing different hypotheses and that this sort of undermined the whole the whole thing you know and this brings up this interesting question like um the link between hypotheses and models you know are, are these uh, are these analytical you know freedoms these garden of forking path decisions are these really degrees of researcher freedom or are we wandering into different hypotheses and is that part of the thing that is mucking up the results, so to, so to speak. I don't know if that answers your question directly, Ramey. I do, I'm not familiar with many of the terms in this. I don't know if any of the other panels panelists are. Ah, OK, no, chat has said my question was answered, yes. OK, um, but if there's no direct comment on that, um, we could come back to this multiverse analysis, because this is really the a really important point, and that is, um, are we simulating, you know, can we simulate what people would really do? And again, you know, a multiverse is a single workflow, right? It's a single statistical software. It's led by a single or a team of researchers, and it's very, you know, contained. It's very cut and dried, whereas the reality of research is they may or may not use that type of software. You know, they may or may not make these different types of decisions and have these different aspects. I mean, one thing in, in the first phase of our study was that people using Stata were more likely to reproduce a result from an original study using Stata, even though they didn't know the original original study was using Stata, for example. So let's bring, let's come back to that topic. Um, I can call on one of you, but I bet you all have something to say on that topic. If anyone wants to jump in, Eric. Sure, sure. No, no, I think, I, I think it's a great point. And it actually kind of harkens back to some of the comments, you know, our, our, our other panel, our, our other panelists has made, right? You know, and as, as Wilson pointed out, you know, it's, and wrote them, it's not realistic for, Every paper, uh, you know, to be, you know, to be a crowd science project. Definitely, us as organizers of these projects have definitely, we definitely couldn't possibly agree more. Not every study should be, uh, sh 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 should be crowdsourced, right? Um, I, I, I think you know, that kind of an effort is most justified when you know there's really high theoretical stakes or really high practical stakes, right? Something with public policy implications. You know, for example, you might be justified in using a crowd approach. But I think most investigations will remain small teams, and you know, and should, right? Because that's a more efficient way to introduce, uh, it, you know, initial, sometimes pretty good initial evidence uh, for an idea, and then only I think the most really high stakes unresolved questions. Uh, really kind of are worthy uh, of the of the crowd approach, but still some of the same ideas, some of the same spirit, right, of, of wondering how uh, many analyses, if not many analysts, you could still see that kind of being introduced more and more uh, into uh, into small team science, which I, th which I think you already are. Uh, it could be multiverse, right, where, you know, one analyst lays out all the defensible specifications that she can kind of imagine, right, and then kind of crosses those, those choice points. It could also be uh, you know, a lot of pre-registered robustness checks, not going so far as a multiverse, but really, you know, pre-registering a bunch of different proper uh, proper tests uh, of the analysis in your eyes. I think it's also worth noting that, you know, the crowd and multiverse are, so the crowd analysis is both less and then more, more and less uh, uh, than, the, uh, than the multiverse, right? So the multiverse captures all defensible specifications from the viewpoint of somebody usually high in expertise. Right, whereas the crowd analysis really gets at a different question, which is what would the results look, what would the analysis look, look like, and what would the results look like if another researcher analyzed it? You know, and these are kind of different questions, right? Meaning that there might be um, uh, some specifications that you know a top expert wouldn't have picked for the multiverse, but that a crowd analyst might pick and that might pass peer review and get into the literature, right? Uh, because you know, the, you know, not everything in the literature is the most solid, is the, is, is the most optimized 
analysis uh, analysis possible. You have a greater diversity of opinions, right? And you know, and, and a priori beliefs. Uh, you know, so, so, so there's value to both, I think, but there's different value. One of them certainly is much easier to do. Uh, you know, if, if you're relatively if you're relatively more a uh, more resource constrained. In addition, I think you can also think of blending the two. So uh, in, the, in the paper that Wilson was on, also led by our, our colleague, Martin Schweinsberg, um, what we did was a multiverse that was based on the choices of the crowd analysts. So first we did the crowd project uh, using a complex data set on scientific debates. Um, you know, we looked at effects of gender and status on, you know, who participates in, in, in scientific conversations. Uh, and then, um, the the we followed that by doing a multiverse that was based not on all the defensible specifications but on the choice points that were that were used by the crowd analysts right and this can help us try to and that was our approach to the parsing problem try to explain how it is uh why is it that the crowd analysts are getting different choices well let's cross all of them and try to kind of uh, decompose it uh as best as you know as best as we can uh, so i think they're, they're they're both hugely valuable in different kinds of situations one's more scalable uh but i think they both have value yeah, the scalable thing is, is I think, a really important topic. Now, uh, there's a hand raised, but I'm not sure if the attendees can actually ask questions. So, uh, okay, we've got, we've got you live, Adam, if you want to ask your question. I, I don't know if you're, if that was intentional with the hand raising. Adam, are you with us? Hi, sorry, that was intentional, but it was a signal to the host of the session rather than a question. So I will now lower my hand again. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no problem. If you come up with a question, feel free to ask it at any point and anyone else in the audience as well. Um, okay, so um, we've covered a lot of ground. So um, one other concern that I personally have, which I'll, I'll introduce is in our study, we were able to identify over 100 um, specifications that different teams made, and, and that included things like what software they use, if you can call that a specification. Um, so given that, we would have needed, without any interactions or anything, probably 1,000 teams to really reliably recover, you know, to not just have empty cells everywhere you know, when we try to explain what specifications led to what outcomes. So essentially, I mean, this is highly problematic, right? We, we don't actually have enough. This is also where the multiverse could come in to try to fill some of the ground. But then again, we have the, the, the issues which have just been discussed. So, um, and I know like fMRI data, if you, if you want to get nitty gritty enough, you could have it be so complex as well. Uh, Again, I'm not the expert, but you could have so many features to the data that the specifications just blow up exponentially, right? And so then the question is again about scalability. And I don't know if any of the panelists want to come in on that topic specifically. Yes, I, if I may. Um, so I think um, what uh, is scary is that the complexity of reality and the, the, the complexity of these questions that we are dealing with, that uh, it, they were complex enough before uh, multi-analyst, uh, from the multi-analyst approach, we looked at them. But if you look at them from that perspective uh, and you see how uh, uh, wide the analytical space can be, then, uh, then it gets gets quite scary because as you mentioned you would need so many teams to understand one single question um, so the i think the real question is then then what to do what to do then uh, should we just say all right let's do too much effort then let's just forget about it and let's have one answer to that question triad one analytical path or, or stop thinking about maybe we are too ambitious with our designs and research questions and we try to squeeze into one uh, research study some some very big question on on some uh, very complicated and complex data set uh, so maybe uh, nowadays it's a general I don't know, feeling or, or, or attitude that uh, you need certain sample size for uh, answering uh, a question uh, on in one study. So maybe in the future, uh, it will be not just the sample size, but also the match between the complexity of 
the analytical pain, space and the, the effort that you put in. So if, if it's a very complex uh, and, and uh, wide um, analytical space, then maybe you should go back to the, the drawing uh, desk and, and, and redesign the experiment, uh, simplify or, or uh, work on the theory and, and have a more uh, precise description of your concepts and, and so on, or uh, put more uh, effort in uh, exploring the robustness of the, the analysis. But I think the worst option is just to say that, oh, that would be too much effort. So let's just uh, pick one answer and, and uh, then uh, make ourselves believe that that's the answer to that research question. I think one thing that what Palazzo said brings up is the current proof thing issue, uh, because, uh, for example, many of our many analysts study, we we don't know the ground truth, right? We just know that people got different results. We don't know which pipeline got as the correct ones, right? Because we just don't know what the correct one is. So maybe multiverse could also be used to try to find, you know, the right pipe. I don't think they're going to be a right pipe, eh, right pipeline, a single one, but probably there are better ones uh, to given situation. Maybe we could use this to try to, you know, find this, identify these ones, and then use them uh, across the field in multiverse uh, analysis uh, for single studies. It's it's hard because it depends on the hypothesis and depends on so many things and the data and so many things, but maybe we could try to, you know, limit the space that way, like try to also have the ground truth because the fact that many, ex even experts, you know, did something doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do, right, or got us the right question. So I think this is another aspect that we should think about and it's harder to have the ground truth in multi-analysts because if if there is a ground truth usually you know the other researchers could also know about it or realize something is you know if you simulate data they could know something about it uh, so maybe this would be easier with just a multiverse analysis on a data where we know simulated data or many different data sets that are simulated and try to you know point us to the right direction which pipelines are the best or the optimal for a specific thing so I think this is another thing that we could try to focus on in the future. Yeah, and that that is a, probably a bit outside of our panel, but it really is a sort of, you know, it's like writing scientific realism on a baseball bat and smacking, you know, us all across the face with it because it's like, as as you know, often qualitative, uh, those using qualitative methods often point out, it's like you know, you can't cross the same river twice, so to speak, and it, and it's like. I was really surprised to see how, for example, in our study, the hypotheses also went in different directions. So you would have researchers that had roughly the same evidence, empirical evidence, but one would say, mm, it's just not testable. And the other would say, oh, yeah, this is support of the hypothesis. And, and this was really like, um, yeah, it, it really calls into question this, this, this grand truth, you know, whether it exists or not, not being the point. The point is, you know, it, it calls into question uh, us as, you know, the subjective side of us, you know, in the process of research and how much this can really, uh, you know, blur or, or mix up the results. Somewhere, I think there are certain uh, uh, constructivists who are cheering for our work, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah, Eric, sorry, yeah. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So, so I, I, I had a couple of thoughts, uh, a couple of thoughts there. So, so I'll, I'll make kind of two, I'll contradict myself a little bit, uh, but I'll say, I'll, I'll kind of make two points. So the first would say, you know, on the one hand, you could say these many analyst results are really quite, you know, disturbing in that, you know, as Rotem and others have pointed out, even in the absence of p-hacking or any incentive to get a particular result, and even if you were to pre-register, different analysts in good faith will choose different approaches and get and get different results. That said, though, you know, you know, we have that, you know, that wonderful compilation right in the in the link in the chat. Uh, we do have to also have a relatively small sample of studies, so we also have to be careful of this and also careful of selection biases. Folks might tend to run many analyst studies on data sets they anticipate being complex enough for that to be worth it. You know, if so, then we might have oversampled relatively more complex data sets. Although it's also worth noting, there's data sets way more complex than the ones uh, than the ones that we've used. Uh, it's also worth noting that. Um, so I'd be very, I'm super excited to see what multi 100, right, uh, uh, Balazs project turns out when you sample more systematically, how big is the spread of, of, of dispersion of estimates across different analysts, you know, for the testing the same hypothesis on the same data. 
Um, I, it is worth noting that the subsequent papers have found more disturb more dispersion of estimates than the original uh, referee red card paper. So, so, so that's the point about saying that you know maybe there's a lot of dispersion and it could be it could be very problematic. On the other hand, though, you know we do need to, we definitely you know need to be conservative and do more projects before drawing uh, any strong conclusions. Also, I also hold out hope uh, that the parsing problem can be you know can be addressed and we can maybe find meaningful moderators that explain it. And the, and the key might be as Osberg and Brutal will point out, and actually we're we're currently talking about doing maybe an adversarial collaboration together. Uh, maybe part of the answer is going further up in the in the tree of decisions, right? So if you go up to the point of how are you interpreting or thinking about the research question, how are you formulating your hypothesis, that might actually be really important. And maybe if we pin that down, and then we also pin down meaningful operation operationalizations of variables. So how you think how you define status is not an arbitrary thing. If you use you know somebody's institutional ranking versus their personal citations, those are meaningful meaningfully different. That's not a random choice. Maybe if we kind of get really specific in these different points in the tree and go all the way up to the theorizing, we can actually potentially say, yes, there is an answer to a question when it's asked in a very, in a very specific way. And if that specificity is drawn from theory, then we kind of do have an answer potentially even across, uh, e even across multiple analysis. So on the one hand, I think it's scary how, many, how, how different the results can be, even with a lack of perverse incentives and say even with pre-registration. On the other hand, I do hold out hope that you know, in the perspective of spirit, we can identify meaningful moderators and find these pockets of coherence that, that, that are answers to specific theoretically meaningful questions. So maybe to bring Wil Wilson back in, if, if you like. So the idea, if I could summarize, is almost to crowdsource theory as a, as a, as a first step, right? And um, would that be a, a realistic way forward for you? What, what do you think about that, Wilson? Well, I think that this field is still relatively new. We are still approaching it with different methods. We're trying to see what is the best way that we can do things. And well, as we always think about many analyst projects, we always focus on the statistics. So we need to remember that our statistical approaches, whether this or that, are models for our thinking. And it, it can only tell us so much about the data that we have. And we should evaluate it with the limitations of our approaches rather than fully believing that our single way of thinking or even our single way of doing it, it's correct. And we also remember that as we see in a lot of our papers, that a lot of times when we ask analysts on why they choose a certain method, they choose it because that's the most comfortable method they have. You know, it might, be the, it might not be the method that is most correct. It might not be the method that is most applicable, but it's something that, you know, we feel comfortable doing and that we have done for many years in our respective fields, be it psychology, sociology, or whatsoever, right? So besides that, I think approaching it with the theoretical approach, you know, approach, approaching it with collecting clean data is a, and good research designs are the ways we can sort of start thinking about it. And of course, to get involved in more meta-scientific and many, many analyst projects to sort of pave the way on how you want to design your study and also, and also to approach other studies as well. Great. Yeah, I think that that points us right in a nice direction where maybe we could have some final thoughts from, from each of the panelists um, although that, that has really been a nice summary of what, what we're doing and what we're talking about. But if there are any uh, final thoughts from the panelists, um, you, you must not, you know, you're not required to say anything, but um, let, let's start maybe with Balaj. Yeah, I, I, I did want to reflect on what Drotum said about whether there is a right uh, statistical path for one data set and one question. And I think that um, makes us feel very uncomfortable or uneasy because then question comes up who will decide which is the right statistical analysis for a research question. Uh, and one answer can be that we should just uh, embrace diversity and, and uh, accept that there is not one uh, right in answer to a question. And there can be different approaches and from different perspectives, there can be different interpretations. But also, uh, I think most of us would uh, accept that there are certain approaches or analytical uh, procedures which are just mistaken sometimes and uh, not rarely the researchers would admit it if they uh, looked into it because analyses are complex and one can make a mistake. By the way, uh, any analysis approach can also bring to the surface when there's a big um, discrepancy that maybe one can find in the uh, code 
the mistake that made. But also at one point, they, they will just never agree on certain approaches. So uh, I think uh, this is something we have to accept in science that while there are certain uh, ways that may be completely wrong, uh, we agree, but also there's a huge gray area where uh, there won't be any authority in telling which approach is the appropriate one. Uh, right now, since there was only one analyst and uh, published one path, then we take it as the right approach. But, but uh, we have to live with the truth, I think, that there can be the, uh, different approaches to the same uh, question and same data set. And uh, if they, they converge, then, then, then they can give us uh, confidence uh, to a level. But uh, this is just uh, not, not a kind of science, I think, where we will ever be really confident about our conclusions. OK, and with five minutes left, um, Eric, I don't know if you have one or two minutes of comments, and then I'll pass it over to Rotem to have a final word. I, 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 I think these are all great points. Uh, uh, one thought I had was that, you know, it might be worth thinking about rather than, you know, which analysis is better, it might be worth thinking about, you know, which are the, which are the ways of thinking about the problem that are meaningfully different and can that potentially, meaning that if, if folks are, are, are essentially asking different questions or thinking about the question in a different enough way that it's almost a different or, or, or that it kind of is a different question, uh, I think that could be a really key a uh, uh, choice point, right? As Osberg and Bruder all point out. So rather than say, you know, one way of thinking about it is better than the other, we might just try to capture again in that perspective of spirit, what are, what are the kind of major ways of thinking in which people approach a problem? And then what are the answers that follow from that? Is there coherence within those or more specific questions or is there not, right? Great, and Rotem, some final thoughts maybe. Yeah, I agree with what Eric just said and what uh, Bala said. And yeah, um, I think this was a fascinating discussion and we, we there are many perspectives on, on this, as we can see. But I think we also convert to some things that we think, you know, we need more studies to see how big the problem is and whether we had a bias in the current studies or not. And we need, you know, more ways to uh, to parse, like we said, to, to parse the, 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 the process of analyzing the data and see where the variability comes from and we, which steps are meaningful, like Eric just said, and, and try to see what we could, like, I think the tension between what theoretically would be best because science is so complicated and, you know, there's so many things that affect the results, what would be the, the ideal way to do it and what would be a practical way to do it. And I think this tension needs to be, you know, we talked about it a bit and we really need to, to find a solution to this, like to find something that can actually be done in a single study, at a single study level and see how we can deal with that. And yeah, I'm really excited about the new project and looking forward to see where we're going with that. Great, well, thanks again, everyone for coming together and including the audience. And um, yeah, it's been a great panel. I think we're basically right in time. I assume that the chat will be accessible along with this recording because there's a lot of useful links in there. Uh, but please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, thanks to the MetaScience uh, conference organizers. It's been a great conference uh, so far. And so I think we can stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nate, for moderating. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so uh, much, everyone, whatever. panelists, attendees, organizers. Thanks, everybody. Whatever thanks time to zone you're in. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to all the many collaborators, you know, on all these projects uh, here in spirit and, and thanks and thank you. Mm -hmm.